This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Welcome to the Young Wealth Show, where you'll truly learn how to make, spend, and invest money for an awesome life. Get the real life stuff that wasn't part of your school curriculum. Young Wealth gives you innovative new ways of dealing with your finances, as well as the skills and tools you're going to need to survive and be successful out on your own. Let the Young Wealth Show be your GPS to take you from clueless to clued in. Here's your host, Jason Hartman, with Young Wealth. It's my pleasure to welcome Greg Lukinoff. He is president and CEO of the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education, otherwise known as FIRE, the acronym. He's a New York Times bestselling author of The Coddling of the American Mind, How Good Intentions and Bad Ideas Are Setting Up in a Generation for Failure, and Unlearning Liberty, Campus Censorship, and the End of American Debate. Greg, welcome. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, I'm a lot uh, colder than you are down in Florida. <laughs> well, uh, I'll tell you, when I woke up this morning, it was exactly by the wind chill factor, 100 degrees cooler in Chicago than it was in Palm Beach, Florida. I, I <laughs> couldn't believe that. Wow. <laughs> Where's all that global warming Al Gore promised? <laughs> well, he changed the name to climate change. So there you go. But hey, you know, you are really writing about some pretty hot topics. I mean, the education system has just been, it's just been co-opted by agenda-laden political correctness and uh, the hypocrisy of the censorship going on in these colleges and what they are doing to certain groups of people is absolutely appalling. Every time I see something about this, which topic do you want to take on first? Actually, one helps me lead into the other. I was actually the weird person who went to law school specifically to study the First Amendment and particularly freedom of speech. I took every class at Stanford Law School offered on the First Amendment, and when I ran out, I started doing independent studies on censorship during their Tudor dynasty in England. I worked at the ACLU of Northern California, and despite all of that training, when I started working on campuses in 2001 as FIRE's first legal director, I was shocked even back then how incredibly easy it was to get in trouble for what you say on campus. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. And, uh, you know, the First Amendment is a topic near and dear to my heart. I just find it endlessly fascinating. I mean, there are lawyers who spend their entire career simply on First Amendment issues. <laughs> so it is a complex area for sure. So on these college campuses, you know, you look at a place like Berkeley, where which is my mother's alma mater. And mm -hmm. of all things, she went to Berkeley in the 60s and yeah. graduated with a degree in social welfare. So that's a pretty liberal pursuit. <laughs> uh, like, right. you know, one, two, three, Berkeley, 60s, social welfare, right? Can't get much more left than that. And she is just appalled at what's going on now, especially at Berkeley. I mean, that, that's, yeah. you know, the bastion of, of free speech, right? And um, yeah. they might be the biggest offenders. Yeah, um, back in 2001, when I was saying it was actually worse than people thought, a common misconception that I run into is people think that the main censors, uh, going back, like going all the way back, it's that it's always been the students, and that essentially the students are really the ones who have become sort of illiberal, you know, the, the people who are anti-free speech. But for the overwhelming majority of my career, what you really had to look out for were the administrators. And as as I'm sure a lot of your listeners know, universities have increasingly over the decades, become more and more run by administrators uh, with this sort of burgeoning bureaucracy at universities. One of the reasons why it's so expensive is because you have uh, new administrators to both <laughs> police your speech and to give you almost no due process if you're accused of anything. Right. And you've got to have administrators to manage the administrators to manage exactly. the administrators. You know, it's like this. When, when you look at government in general, and universities are kind of a pseudo-governmental thing. If any government building has 10 stories, we all like the first three stories. You know, the people that provide in the, the metaphor, police and fire protection and rule of law. Right. That's great. It's the top seven stories you can probably just get rid of. <laughs> <laughs> right. that, that's, the, that's the true meaning of overhead. Yeah, that's a great point. So for most of my career, it was actually the administrators who were getting people in trouble for, you know, some classic cases that I talk about on Learning Liberty. 
or the famous case of a student who's reading a book called Notre Dame versus the Klan. It's a book that was actually was joyously against uh, a, Notre, uh, a Klan march on Notre Dame in the 1920s. And it's about how Notre Dame students came together and defeated the Ku Klux Klan in a street battle. It's like a really cool book. But because it had the word Klan on the cover and because it showed a Klan rally, someone assumed this was racially offensive. And without so much as a hearing, the student uh, who was a student employee, who was actually working his way through school as a janitor, not, you know, not, not, not exactly someone that you would think of as anything other than the underdog, was found guilty of racial harassment um, by the university. And it was only through the efforts of for, uh, fire. Wait, wait, wait. For simply reading a book? For publicly reading a book that people misconstrued as being racist or racially offensive, yes. I, I mean, this is, I'd almost venture to say, is this worse, this era in which we are living? living in this one vein is it worse than the era of the nazis burning books you know fahrenheit 451 i mean this is crazy it's well it, it it definitely is silly here i would say that my dad grew up in a nazi occupation in yugoslavia i definitely have no problem saying nazis way way worse way way but worse ter- but i'm just talking way, about way, way this worse. one little but in terms area of, i'm, but I'm in certainly terms not of talking about over that. Yeah. In terms of, like, you got to be kidding me, like, right. there's nothing laughable, of course, about the actual Nazis. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to, are you joking or not? Actually, that's something I forgot to mention dur- during the pre-interview, is I'm also the uh, executive producer of a movie called Can We Take a Joke, mm-hmm. which is about how you can't actually have comedy on campus and, and this culture of political correctness. So I think, I think your listeners would really enjoy that movie, which you can find on Amazon. You can find everywhere at this point. Yeah, interesting. Just, you know, my, my remark about those uh, oppressive uh, German <laughs> book burners, it's not to say that the rest of the stuff the Nazis did, of course, that's horrific. Sure, sure, sure. But the book censorship, like at least with their uh, version of censorship and book burning, it was a clear agenda. You know, you knew mm-hmm. what they were doing. Now you don't even know the rules. You know, it, it's 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 just <laughs> right. it's just nuts if it has some little inkling of of offending one person who doesn't even know what it's about. I mean, your example right. is exactly right. That's crazy. So my book on learning liberty, which I wrote in 2012 was primarily about administrative censorship. And prior to that, the students had overwhelmingly been on our side. That usually comes as a surprise to to, to listeners. But that's only because sometime around 2013, 2014, you start seeing this real emergence of this very anti-free speech, sort of politicized attitude among students. And it's it's still a relative minority of students, but they've, they've become much more powerful. And that's when you see things like the disinvitation of Condoleezza Rice from school. That's when you have microaggression policies popping out of nowhere, something that nobody had heard of before. Trigger warnings, of course, came out of, uh, came out of this phase. This was a really disappointing thing for me to see because I like students, but suddenly we were on the other side. Uh, you know, we were battling students who wanted to shut up, uh, you know, sometimes professors, sometimes their fellow students who said things that they managed to find um, insulting. So the book that most recently came out, the, the, the New York Times bestseller that I wrote with, with um, Jonathan Haidt, Coddling of the American Mind, it's all about trying to get to the bottom of what was so different with the, uh, the class that entered college in 2013, 2014. Okay, well, what was it? You can really pin it to that time frame, huh? That's, that's It amazing. felt like it was overnight, because mm-hmm. definitely sure, you know, you had some students who were would want you know someone fired for something really tame or whatever, but suddenly you had some kind of critical mass of them, and it really felt like it was overnight. Suddenly, nobody had heard of trigger warnings, nobody had heard of microaggressions. Next thing you know, people are you know demanding that nobody who's ever said anything that they deem offensive, <laughs> which is very hard to figure out, going far far back, are emerging. So the book in the book we actually uh, talk about six different trends that sort of intersect around that time. But I'd say that the two biggest, one that didn't surprise us very much, the other one that did, one was uh, social media. Um, social media, which I loved in a lot of different ways. And, well, and I think social Twitter, media before that? I mean, it wasn't new, right? This was the first generation to grow up with it, though. And mm. so basically, if you line things up according to like when kids could first get onto Twitter and when it became normal for people to right, have right. Uh, cell phones in their pocket and be on social media 24 hours a day, that's really more or less what it, we now designate mm-hmm. as Generation Z or iGen, right. people born in 1995 or after. Mm-hmm. And it really does show, like, if, if you do the, and this is all over the book, if, if you look at the characteristics of millennials and you compare them against iGen, 
some of the attitudes are just very dramatically different, particularly when it comes to uh, freedom of speech. Okay, so so compare that. And, and what do you mean iGen? I mean, Gen Z is what it's called, right? Uh, iGen is actually Gen my Y-Y preferred way to refer yeah. to it. Okay. What's um, I-Gen? But I-Gen. Gen Z seems to have won out. <laughs> right, yeah. No, okay. it, it's the same thing, though. It's just so, so people the born in 1995. The, the millennials are Generation Y, and uh, I'm a Gen Xer, uh, just for context. I'm a Gen Xer myself, too. Yeah, and then there are baby boomers that are older than us, uh, and then we've got Gen Z, or otherwise known as iGen. I haven't heard that one before. So yep. the Gen Z group is the first one that really grew up with social media. Now, one of the characteristics, certainly all of our listeners have noticed on social media, and it's a very negative uh, characteristic, I would argue, sure. is that there's this piling on concept yes. that goes on on social media. And that's probably a big part of this, I would guess. Uh, yes Absolutely. or no? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and that's one of the reasons why we think it affected this generation so much. And the scariest thing that lines up, and one of the things that really surprised us when we we're doing the research, is that when you look at Gen Z, when you look at um, iGen, they have much higher rates of anxiety and depression, much higher rates of suicide, unfortunately, than people who came before them. And the way I try to explain it uh, to people is imagine the absolute worst of Twitter or Facebook. Imagine at the same time the absolute worst of junior high school, 24 hours a day, forever. <laughs> and so you, uh, yeah, you have it, these, it just this goes on forever. The the Mean Girls concept, right? It, it just it just it, seems like a nightmare it, world. It's and, a, and it's and a it 24 is, hour it is thing, taking, yeah. taking a mental toll. And yeah. the, and what they're used to are these you know internet pylons and. Also, social media really kind of pats you on the back for having uh, as thick of an echo chamber as you can get. Mm -hmm. So social media is definitely part of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. When it comes to why this is happening more at elite colleges, a lot of what we found in our book points towards helicopter parenting as being a big part of the problem. And what's interesting about helicopter parenting is that it has this kind of paranoid aspect to it. We actually call it the special brand of it we call paranoid parenting, where there's this sort of like obsession with protecting your kids from practically everything, even if it's just something that might be emotionally difficult for students. But of course, this is happening at a time when from about 1991 on, um, the U.S. is actually just getting safer when it comes to everything from murder to accidental death. It was much more dangerous when we were kids than it, than it is now. But our parents were <laughs> not nearly as paranoid as, as, as parents are today. And that, I, that adds to anxiety, depression, a lot of the things that actually make this kind of medicalized. This is a point that I, I left out. One of the things that was so different about the students in 2013 and 14 is they weren't saying, this guy can't speak on campus because I'm offended. They were saying, well, they're saying that too. But they were saying more often, this guy can't speak on campus because someone might find it triggering or traumatic or in some way literally medically harmful to me. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the reasons why I wrote this book with a, with a social psychologist, because we're like, this is not good science. This is crazy. Mm-hmm. Okay, so, uh, wow, this is, uh, <laughs> well, I want to make sure you take some time at the end to prescribe some action steps. Sure, like, sure. What, what are we going to do about this? But when you talk about the elite colleges versus the non-elite colleges, I guess I'll call them, and the helicopter parenting. Basically, the premise there seems to be that the the wealthier parents that can afford to get their kids into these elite colleges are more helicopter parentish, and so those kids are less able to do for themselves. They're right. They're weaker. They're you know they're they're just not as capable, and so they probably pile. See. In the old days, when you wanted to pile on, you did it with actual personal risk. So you, you right. in your mind, would have to weigh out whether or not you should do that. You know, should you side right. with the bully or not, right? And now you can just click a mouse, you know, click the like yep. button. The problem now is that there's not enough consequence for mm-hmm. actions. You know, people can do them from this sterile keyboard Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde type of, you know, paradigm we're living in. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and that's the thing is like people act very differently when they're face to face. But when, when that's completely depersonalized, 
when you know people are doing this at like one o'clock in the morning and they feel like they have they can see all the people who are with them they can't see all the other people who think that they're crazy and right. it just creates this kind of like vicious kind of mob mentality yeah yeah it really does you know i'd compare this to driving i mean i remember mm-hmm. when i took driver's ed classes years ago they showed this funny little cartoonish video of the dr jekyll and mr hyde concept how people in their normal life will act courteous and with good etiquette and so forth walking down the street and then they'll get in a car and they become this monster because they've got this yeah. you know tons of steel around them and uh, <laughs> right. you know they'll cut people off and give them the finger and social media or just internet in general really fosters that i would say yeah and it's interesting the dynamic is similar to driving in another way which is research that shows and something that will surprise absolutely no one who is ever a teenager is that teenagers tend to drive less responsibly and faster when they have their friends in the car mm-hmm. yeah right <laughs> because they feel sort of goaded on they want to impress them and it takes on a whole kind of toxic dynamic sure so what can be done first thing i'd ask your listeners to do is go to the fire dot org um, that's my organization to find out more about the situation for free speech on campus certainly sit down and read recalling the american mind and unlearning liberty if you have the time but as far as immediate steps you know there's a lot of kind of like there's nothing to be done with college kids there's nothing to be done to, to fix this free speech problem and even though i'm in the belly of the beast and seeing the worst of the worst I reject that because I think we haven't even really begun to fight. People lament a lot of what's going on. But for example, colleges should be teaching on day one in orientation the importance of freedom of speech, the importance of occasionally being offended even um, as part of a good education. Whereas right now in a lot of campuses, particularly the elite ones, they're learning something that sounds a lot more like, if you're offended, please report it to an administrator at, at the college. But now that universities are seeing, um, this is actually, believe it or not, has created an opportunity for fire, is that professors um, and administrators themselves are starting to get a little, for lack of a better word, freaked out by the fact that it's so easy to get in trouble for what you say on the modern campus, that there is some schools like University of Chicago that's making a real effort to sort of rein this in, teach people about freedom of speech, teach them about the idea you don't have a right not to be offended uh, early on. And until we start doing some of that kind of education, both in college and in high school um, that we can't even start to consider giving up. Yeah, okay. You know, I suppose this has always been this way. Every generation comments on the generation Mm -hmm. to come after them. And, you know, they usually say, look, they're spoiled, they're coddled, blah, blah, blah. I don't think this is a new thing, right? right? But look, at the millennial generation was most definitely the most coddled generation in human history. And is Gen Y even even more so? We actually weren't huge fans of, of the word coddled in the title, and we kind of fought against it until we were more or less told by our publishers, love it or leave it. That, that, that's the one that's be... going to sell. <laughs> <laughs> right. And it was the one we wrote, wrote an article back in 2015 with this title. But when it comes to you know being being able to take for granted a lot of affluence, a lot of comfort, ability to you know sort of live in a community that's kind of an echo chamber, that's available at a level that was undreamable to our grandparents and parents. So a lot of people say, oh, this is just old men saying things were tougher in my day. Mm-hmm. Well, to be honest, pretty much anybody who was born over the last 200 years, or at least most people, or at least the last 100 years, it's a safe bet that their parents and grandparents actually did have it harder than they yeah, did. Yeah, right, right. right. In, in, in a, which, so I, I never, I never I'm kind of like, listen, I wrote a short book called Freedom From Speech in 2014. This is my shortest book of all. And I talk about these as problems of comfort, that essentially kind of like these are problems that generate when other things are, other things are going well. So I actually have the somewhat pessimistic view that as other things get better, people's respect for free speech goes down. Yep. Very interesting. Okay. So um, give out your website and uh, sure. tell us a little bit about FIRE. It's a, it's a not-for-profit, right? We're a nonprofit. I work out of the D.C. office, which is about 10% of the, of the staff. The headquarters is actually in Philadelphia. We defend students all over the country and, and colleges all across the country. And when you say defend, does that mean litigation? Does it mean... Um... It usually means that we first consult with students and we try to figure out a way to get it solved without uh, litigation. So universities are pretty worried, for example, like if we can't come to some kind of conclusion with them, we'll do a press release and universities hate bad publicity. So we, we actually win by doing things short of litigation all the time. But we do litigate and we're litigating more and more um, 
particularly under First Amendment principles. Mm -hmm. But most of our successes, frankly, have been through this more informal process of making universities um, you know, pay a consequence for abusing the students' and professors' rights. And, and what's that? Simply uh, exposing their misdeeds? Yeah. Uh, and yeah, right, right. You know, they, they know it will cost them in real material dollars if their reputation suffers. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. that's one of the reasons why, you know, greater awareness of when a, a university has a, you know, abused their students. And actually on that note, we're about to come out with a, with our 10 worst schools for free speech list. I think that's coming out next week. <laughs> oh boy, that's interesting. Just begs the question, do you get sued for this? Like when you publish a list like that, do these universities turn around and sue you? You know, look, at I am a consumer advocate. I've outed yep. a couple of bad, bad actors on my show, and I've been sued twice for it. And uh, yep. you know what, though? I, I got to make a contribution to the world. You know, I'm, I'm willing to take that risk. Both turned out to be frivolous, uh, you know, uh, but... I just think, you know, you got to you got to do something uh, for the person that comes after you, because if you just ignore these things, then they feel they can just keep rolling over people like this. Yep. Agreed. Yeah. Um, so far, um, I'm knocking on wood right now, yeah. um, even though we've won uh, and been involved in literally thousands of cases, we have never been sued by yeah. a university. And I think it would be pretty gutsy or dumb yeah. <laughs> move yeah. for a university to actually try to sue us, because uh -huh. in terms of lawyers at fire, we're overwhelmingly First Amendment lawyers. So like, we know how to defend ourselves in right. these cases. Yeah. And in terms of PR, the idea of, of suing a well-known well and respected free speech group, that's not the kind of bad publicity a school wants. Yeah, very, very interesting. Okay, so anything more about the books? You gave out the website, right? Yep, thefire.org. We have all sorts of resources there. We have guides for uh, people. If you have kids who are going to college, we have something on due process and fair procedure. It's a guide to that, which I recommend every single student read before they go to school. We have uh, rankings of schools according to their speech codes. Um, about a third of schools have codes that are what I'd call laughably unconstitutional. We even have started ranking um, universities on how good their procedures are in terms of like if you get accused or you know are you presumed in innocent and actually at the overwhelming majority of schools so far you're not presumed innocent when you're accused uh, accused of anything yeah. so we have a tremendous number of resources well i think it depends I, I think it depends if you're a male if you're a male you must automatically be guilty uh <laughs> you know that's i um read part of tucker carlson's book uh, ship of fools uh, uh -huh. which i mean the things they are doing to especially men on, on some mm -hmm. of these campuses, it is mind boggling. It is a crime what is happening to these, these young men. And I mean, we saw it at Duke. We see these false accusations all the time. It is just, it's mind boggling. It really is. One of the other things the fire does, and I emphasize the free speech academic freedom side of what we do, but also one of our big causes is due process. And that's overwhelmingly the student, largely men, you know, accused of sexual misconduct, which you always have to point out, you know, particularly since it's on the, under the umbrella of harassment, can be everything from something as serious as an accusation of rape, but also to accusations of someone just saying something that someone found offensive. So for me, like there was a school, I can't remember what school it was, but I testified about it in front of Congress about this, that actually explained um, harassment exists on a spectrum from anything from a cat call to uh, forcible rape. And I was like, okay, if you can't distinguish well between these two concepts, you're really messed up here. You know what the really sad part about it is, is that the people that promote some of these really outlandish ideas are hurting their own cause. Yes. Because what it's doing is it's minimizing the real offenses. They're just making everything, you know, offensive or uh, misconduct. And when you, when you label everything that way, then yeah. when the real case comes along, the real tragic thing that should be punished and should, you know, the person should be held accountable, they're all now under the same umbrella. You know, it's absolutely. Uh, yeah. and, and we say this all the time. I try to be really clear about this. We care about due process and we care about fairness in these procedures, not just to make sure that innocent people walk free, but also so guilty people get punished. Right. Because the more silly and arbitrary you make the process mm -hmm. on campus, the one, the less people trust it, but the more you introduce situations in which if it's someone who's accused that's the son of a big donor or you know, or of a professor or someone they like, um, they're not going to get the kind of you know, rigor that they're supposed to. Meanwhile, if it's some, you know, like a... <laughs> 
<laughs> basically first generation student like me from lower income bracket. You know, I'm I'm not one of their going to be one of their favorites. And that essentially concerns about due process is necessary to make sure you not just that you have a fair system, but also that you have an accurate one. Right. Yeah, no, it's very scary that they are really hurting their own cause. And, Absolutely. you know, there's a, there's a zillion other social ripples there. Like, and this is what you can't see. You know, I always talk about how you can't hear the dogs that don't bark. I mean, yep. what about, you know, no one will ever be able to know all of the legitimate, happy relationships that might have occurred mm -hmm. if especially males weren't so intimidated and bullied. You know, because they're they're afraid to ask a girl out. You know, it, it's well, well, in coddling of the American mind, uh, it's a little bit of a different take on it. It's one of these things where, particularly in the um, realm of race, that essentially I feel like what a lot of what we're doing with the speech policing is making it very difficult for people to make friends with people who don't look like them, mm -hmm. partially because if you make the threshold of being offended so very very low, it's not as if people really change their minds or, or won't tell racy jokes. They just will only tell them to people who already agree with them and not risk actually becoming friends with people who they think might come from a different point of view. And so universities, when they look at this stuff, they're kind of like, oh, it seems like um, despite all of our diversity and inclusion efforts, people are getting more driven away. And it's like, don't you understand that some of what you're doing here is encouraging to see, you know, people who could be friends to see each other as enemies? Right. Yeah. Well, that's, um, you know, one of the big promises of the Obama administration was, you know, you bring people together, the great uniter. And I mean, many people would argue that uh, things got more divided than ever under Obama. Now, you know, the Trump is a whole different story, but in kind of a different way, obviously a different theme. But, you know, certainly under Obama, that administration was not good for race relations. <laughs> you know, like, I don't think anyone could argue that. Well, definitely we were, um, you know, Obama actually said some pretty good stuff after our first article came out about students being too coddled and really great stuff actually about talking across lines of differences. At the same time, we were really critical of his Department of Education that was mandating reducing um, the standards of evidence for people accused of harassment. I remember that. And was that reversed or did that ever go into effect? I mean, where... Actually, you know, where, yes. I mean, I mean, was... I mean, I mean, let's just go into that for just a quick moment. You know, sure. the basic... One of the basic tenets of our justice system that makes it so great is everybody has the right to face their accuser. Right. And under Obama's agenda, he was going to take that away where you would have no right to literally face your accuser. I mean, just yeah. unbelievable. The Department of Education, when I first started in this job back in 2001, was mostly kind of like a boogeyman. Universities would restrict due process rights and restrict free speech rights and claim the Department of Education was making them do it. And the Department of Education would write stuff saying, no, we're not. <laughs> but unfortunately, around 2011, um, that's when you start having the first Dear Colleague letter coming out to universities that's saying, you know, reduce the rights of people accused of harassment, and that includes sexual assault. And we fought that tooth and nail for years, with under no illusion that we would necessarily ever win on this. But as story after story came up of people obviously innocent being accused, and, you know, and well, I'll give credit where credit is due, thanks to the Trump's uh, appointments, including Betsy DeVos, we actually got some serious reforms on that in the past year, which, which uh, was a battle that we fought tooth and nail, but never... Never thought we'd, we'd win. <laughs> yeah, yeah, something else. You know, uh, remember that old quote, folks, uh, and I think it might have been Voltaire or something who said, uh, I may disagree with what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. And, yep. you know, if that person you're looking at across the room is a victim today and you think you don't care, remember, that could easily be you next. OK, absolutely. So, so this is important stuff. Hey, thanks again for joining us. Uh, really appreciate it. Give out the website one more time. Thefire.org. Fantastic. Keep up the good work. Absolutely. Take care. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, hartmanmedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own, and if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional. And we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go 
go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode. Thank you.